here we are at the Shell Pennzoil Grand Prix of Houston with my friend John Ennessy. Hey, Mr. Taylor, how John, are you? I've been sitting here across from this Cadillac. Yeah. That my guess is it says twin turbo on the hood. Yeah. What do we got? A thousand horsepower? You're a little low. It's about twelve hundred and twenty six horsepower. Twelve hundred and twenty six horsepower out of a Cadillac. It's and a I wagon. Knew, I know, a wagon, yeah, even sure. better. I knew something was going on when I saw the giant wheels and the flares on the right. only John Hennessy does that to a Cadillac. It's a wagon. little bit of a sleeper, but you look at it closely, you're like, there's something about that Cadillac that's not stock. <laughs> you build an amazing machine and it lasts. I try to build it like I build it for myself. We build about 500 cars a year, and um, you know, it's 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 enthusiasts for enthusiasts. So you know, it's all about fun and having something powerful. But I, I mean, we build some race cars, but I want people to be able to drive them every day, put pump gas on them, pass their smog tests, and uh, have something that, that's reliable and easy to drive. You'll see a lot of Hennessy machines on the covers of magazines like Motor Trend, Car and Driver, Road and Track, and the fastest car in the world right now. Yeah. And he's wearing it on a shirt, the Venom GT. Right there. Yeah. Powered by Penzel. How was that? That was amazing. It was really cool. I mean, we got a chance to take it to the space shuttle runway at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. You know, the existing record with Bugatti is around 268 miles an hour. And we wanted to beat it by a lot. beat it by a little bit, we ran 270.49, but the car was still accelerating. We were still, it took us about 11 seconds to go from 260 to 270. So the car was still pulling, we just ran out of runway. Yeah. So at some point, maybe we got a bottle or somewhere else, but right now, it's the fastest. People say, somebody was asking me yesterday, hey, when are you guys gonna go out and run it again? I'm like, when I have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was expensive, it was time consuming, it was risky, but I'm glad we did it. And uh, American car, uh, and, and run, the, run the record in America, so. Let's talk about the Venom GT. What is it? What do you guys do to make this machine? The idea of the Venom was to build the fastest car that we could build. And by doing that, I didn't want to just have lots and lots of horsepower. It's got 1,244 horsepower. In a car also, that weighs under 300 pounds? It, weigh, it, weigh, it weighs 2,743 pounds. Oh so it's about the power to weight ratio. Yeah. It has one horsepower per kilogram of curb weight. So one horsepower per 2.2 .2 pounds. And, um, you know, that's really an unmatched power to weight ratio, and that's what makes the car really special. Walk me through its life. Where is okay. it born? Okay, so basically we didn't want to start from scratch. We modify cars, that's what we do. So we wanted to start with something that was very light. We looked at the Viper, Ford GT. Those cars are all still too heavy. We just joked about, hey, why don't we take a Lotus Elise or an Exige and put a V10 twin turbo Viper engine in the back. We kind of joked about it, but after I did some renderings on it, I thought, maybe we can build that car. So what we do is, is we take a lease or an Exige from Lotus and we keep the cockpit. So we didn't have to design the dash, we didn't have to design the door panels. We kind of already had the interior of a car and we build our car around it. So it's all carbon fiber, everything from behind the seats is all new, everything from in front of the dash is all new. So it's about 90% our car, about 10% Lotus. And Which we, is it, not a bad thing. No, it's not a bad thing. It basically, it, 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 it cut our you know, the amount of money that we had to spend and the time that we had to work with by a great deal, not having to design door panels and, and all knobs that, right. and air yeah. conditioning systems. And it gave us what we wanted, super lightweight with maximum horsepower and a usable, comfortable to drive package. So these cars are a taste over a million bucks. A million two. And how many do you build a year? We build on average two to three a year. Uh, we now have a dealer in China that we're real excited about with and I met them yesterday and. We think that that's a, a, a great uh, a market, for a potential market for us. So, uh, yeah, we built 12 cars today, and we're not going to build any more than 29 Venom GTs. So. 12 cars up to today for the right. Venom Yeah, GT. we built a total of 12 cars over the last four years. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So here's a car that's you know one day probably going to hit 300 miles an hour, knowing John Hennessy, little Maybe. guy from Texas little here guy from by the way. So now you have this great relationship with Shell, right? You were involved with this big TV production. Roll through that a little. Um, the folks in Shell were in Houston. The Shell people are in Houston. And the folks in Pennzoil reached out to us at the last Grand Prix back in 13 and said, hey, look, we, we think we could do some things to help you guys. And we think you could help us promote our, our brand. I'm like, cool, you guys are Houston guys, your car guys, you sponsor the race. Let's talk about it. And they said, we hear you're working on breaking this record. I said, yep. 
Venom GT, and they said, well, look, we've got this brand new uh, synthetic oil product that we're getting ready to bring to market, and we think that uh, it would be great for your engine. So they told me about it. It's called Pure Plus, and it, they basically take natural gas, convert it to a motor oil, very pure, and, and when they said the words, Roger Penske uses it in his Indy cars, and it's the same stuff you could buy at Walmart or O'Reilly's yeah. or wherever, yeah. uh, I'm like, that's all I need to know. You yeah. don't need to bring on all the scientists that Penske yeah. <laughs> believes it's the best, and that's what he runs in his race cars, I'll try it out. Right. So we put it in the car and performed flawlessly. I mean, we did a lot of tests leading up to the 270 run, and when you go to try to make a streetcar run 270 miles an hour, there's lots of variables, there's lots of things we're worried about. The tires, the driver, is there a critter gonna run across the road? But it was really gave me a lot of peace of mind to know that my engine would be secure, I didn't have to worry about the oil, I didn't have to worry about starving for oil or, or any of the issues that can happen with an oil that's being pushed at 7,500 RPM at 270 miles an hour. Right. That was one problem I didn't have to worry yeah, about. Yeah, but these are, they do 12,000 RPMs in these Indy cars, exactly. right? Exactly. Oh. So, so yeah. the nice thing was, as they said, look, we not only we want to provide you with the product, we want to try to help tell not only your story, but a story about other guys that had the need for speed and wanted to go out and make a car go fast. So they hired a, a TV production company called Bandito Brothers, which did the movie Act of Valor, which is one of my favorite movies. Yeah. And they came in with us, went, to, went with us to NASA when we ran our 270. And then they told a greater story about, kind of back to the beginning of, of automobiles and guys trying to break 35 and 40 miles an hour, leading up to Malcolm Campbell and some of his speed records from back in the 20s and 30s, right. to yeah. Craig Breedlove with the uh, 600 mile an hour car back in the 60s with a kind of a home built, you know, Bonneville right. car right. with a with a, uh, a jet engine out of a, out of a scrapyard. Yeah. Uh, it was a really cool deal, and you can go to the the Penzl YouTube channel. And the cool thing is, is you can click on the breaking barriers, and they have it broken up into like ten different sections. You can watch the whole forty-five minute deal. It was on National Geographic right, a couple right, months ago. Right, right. It so was a cool awesome. story, and we're, we're we're honored to be a part of that story, and uh, yeah. and well, thankful for the folks from Shell Penzl. Your video has been watched. This is the uh, world's fastest car right now. Right. How many times now? 6.7 million YouTube views in four months. 6.7 million views on YouTube in four months. You got one note from one guy that meant a whole lot to you. And I got to tell you, that's a, ter a tearjerker. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, the the way you that. did this, by the way, with uh, President Kennedy's voice. Yeah. Tell that story. This all right, is like all right. awesome. So I'll try to keep it brief. Yeah. So we went to NASA the first time back in January got rained out. It's kind of a bummer. We're regrouped. The Shell folks came in and said, look, if you want to go back, we'll maybe help cover some of your expenses, bring the video guys. We're like, great, that helps a lot. So I was working with my guys in the shop, and I, I wanted to kind of get them some extra motivation to really kind of focus on making the car the best it could be to go out and run the number. And so after church one day, I'm sitting at lunch with my kids, and we're talking about <laughs> going down to NASA. And I said, you know, I said, this whole thing with the Venom GT, it's kind of in a way like when the astronauts were trying to go to space and go to the moon. I said, it wasn't an easy deal, but they knew that because it was going to be really hard that they would learn a lot, they would become better engineers, better pilots, better astronauts. And I said, really, it's kind of the same way for us on a much smaller scale. By us doing something that's hard, not because it's easy, we'll be a better team, we'll have a better car. Went on YouTube, found a video clip, it's the Kennedy called the Kennedy Moon Speech. He gave it at Rice University here in Houston back in September 61. So I sent that video clip to my team. I said, look at this, think about this as you're prepping the car to go to NASA. Kind of forgot about it. We went and ran the number. My video guy, when he edited together the video, he thought, gosh, I'll take that voiceover from Kennedy. And he overlaid that as we're kind of prepping the car. So and awesome. the thing the thing that was just like, like my wife, when I was done at the first run at NASA and we didn't get to run the car, she said, are you disappointed? I said, Maybe a little bit, but I said there was just, I had a special feeling like I was on hallowed ground being at NASA. I was a space geek as a kid. Yeah. I was all into the NASA stuff. I remember watching <laughs> Apollo 11 landing on the moon and Neil Armstrong putting his foot down on the, on the moon for the first time. And I said, I just had a very surreal feel that I was in a real special place the whole time I'm there. Totally. So I said, no, I I'm not bummed out. And we're going to go back and get the number. Right. And it's just an incredible privilege just to ha have an opportunity to, to set a record at a place that I mean, Americans have, have given their lives to, you know, break barriers and go into space and go to the moon. And so it was just something that I just felt very, very privileged and special. And then when we got the number, we, you know, we, we gave our, our 
our world record certificate. We gave it to the NASA director at the yeah, Kennedy great. Space Center, and and that was a pretty cool deal. So, so we put that you know that voiceover of Kennedy's speech in our YouTube video. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Fast forward a couple months later, I got a chance to go to Detroit. Good friend Jim Farley, VP of, of product and marketing at, at Ford, invited me to come up and look at the new Mustang. So we go up, I go up with my partner Don, and we get to Detroit, it's March, and it's snowing like crazy. Right. So we get up there and on our way to go see Farley and then go to the engineering building for the Mustang, the power goes out. And we get a call from the Mustang guy saying, look, the power's out, there's no lights. The, the, the walk around the review of the cars canceled. I'm like, that's a bummer. But we still get to see Farley. So we go to Farley's office. We're hanging out, waiting for him to wrap up into the meeting. And I'm just sitting there just checking my emails. And I look up, and down the hallway is this red-haired guy with a big smile on his face, Alan Mulally, CEO of Ford. Yeah. I've seen him at auto shows, seen him on the news Greatest a lot. Guy in He's the retiring world. soon. Yeah. I didn't know a lot about Mulally. All I knew was is he probably had a lot to do with uh, the fact that Ford avoided the bailout and didn't go into bankruptcy. So you know what? heard all this great stuff about the guy, Absolutely. but I'm like, if he's not making cars go fast, I'm not really studying him that closely, but I know he's a good guy. Yeah. And he's got a lot of good guys working for him at Ford. The guy looks at me, total stranger, smiles and waits. Just as he's walking down the hallway to his board meeting. I'm yeah. thinking, that's pretty cool. He knows who that's you kind are. Of, no, yeah. he did not know. I mean, oh, I just, had to be, no, I'm total okay. stranger. I'm okay. just some dude. I'm some guy there to see Farley. Right. You know, maybe I'm, I don't know, he doesn't know who I am. Yeah. So yeah. I just always thought, that's pretty cool. This guy's running one of the biggest corporations that's the, that's in the world. That's the way that man is. Well, I came to find that out. Yeah. So I um, had a nice meeting with Jim, and then uh, the next day I'm going to get on a plane and come back to Houston. Well, the, the day after that is our biggest track event at our facility in Sealy called TX2K. We have like 20,000 people coming for this race. So my partner Don's on Delta. He flies home, gets out no problem. The plane breaks, I'm stuck in the plane. I'm like, <laughs> so while I'm hoping the plane's gonna get fixed, I'm sitting there twiddling my thumbs, start surfing around my phone. I'm like, what's the deal with this Malali guy? How can some big time CEO that's got the weight of a whole big company and hundreds of thousands of employees on his mind have enough joy in his heart to look at a total stranger, smile and wave? That just really, that really kind of blew me away. Look up his bio, Wikipedia, second paragraph. When Alan Mulally was 17 years old, he heard Kennedy give the moon speech, and that inspired him to want to become an astronaut. Look at that. He ends up going to Boeing, <laughs> rises up to CEO of Boeing, and now he's at Ford running right. Ford. And I thought, I wanted to be an astronaut too. And that's kind of, yeah. I didn't get to become a pilot or an astronaut, but I'm now modifying cards and got to set a record right. at Kennedy. That's kind of a cool connection. So yeah. I emailed that little link to Farley, and I said, Jim, this is kind of really cool. I said, your boss and I have this whole Thing astronaut yeah. NASA connection. And I didn't think much about it, so I'm, 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 I'm bummed out. I'm wandering through the airport. I got to go get my bags. I'm stuck. I got to spend the night another night. I'm missing my big event at the track. I'm thinking, I could think of a lot of other things I could have done instead of going to Detroit for three days, right. get to see Farley and have, and have Malali wave at me down the hallway. Yeah. That's cool, but I'm like, anyway, I was bummed out. My phone rings. And it was Malali's secretary. Mr. Hennessy, Mr. Malali, I'd like to speak to you. Well, I guess Farley forwarded that email to Malali. Malali, I guess he hadn't seen the video. What did he say? He watched it and he picks up the phone and says, John, Al Malali, I just watched your video and it brought a tear to my eye. Isn't that great? Hey, and I'm in the middle of the Detroit it, airport. It's that kind of, I'm telling you, you guys got to go look at this. It's that it's, kind of, when you hear Kennedy, it is so powerful. And why do you think almost well, 7 million people have watched it? Probably? You know the thing about Good with, the, job. With, with the Kennedy speech is that you think about Kennedy in 61. He's throwing out there the big, hairy, audacious goal. Our country is not only gonna, I mean, going to put a man in space. I mean, the Russians kind of already you know, beat us with Sputnik, and we're all, it's, it's the Cold War and we're all that. We're going to walk but on the moon. Not only, yeah, we're not just going to put a man in space. We're going to have a man that's going to walk on the moon. In 1961. He dies in 63, and our country fulfills that promise in 69. Yeah. That just goes to show how powerful words are, yeah. how powerful the words of the president are. Yeah. Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter. The president's words have great power and great inspiration. And Kennedy was a very inspirational yeah, he was, he was. president. And moving that forward, those words that Kennedy spoke, in some way, 
led Alan Malloy to, to do a Absolutely. great job at Boeing, yeah. design and build all kinds of great aircraft that we sell all over the world. Yeah. So the people all over the world send their money here, and now he did that with Ford. That is called the ripple effect. Yeah. And you know what? You're the kind of guy that also puts a ripple effect out there. Well, because I just, you, you know, do what you do in such an honest and honorable way with the machines that you work on and the, the quality of the work that you guys do. And now you have a tuner school to teach the young and the interested, because right. you don't have to just be young. But you have, you, know, you have risen up through the years, through hard times like all sure. of us. Sure. And to get to a place now where these giants like Shell and, right. and Alan Malala, well, you know, they want to they want to be with you. Here's my takeaway from the guys at Shell and the guy and a guy like Malali. These guys reached out to a little guy and were decent and gave me their time and gave me their encouragement. And I've studied Malali a lot since that phone call. I had a chance to meet him in his office. He gave me an hour of his time in Dearborn That's awesome. after his retirement was announced. And it just every day I wake up and I'm like, how can I be a better dad? How can I be a better husband? How can I be a better leader in my business? Because I'm like, these guys, the Shell guys, you know, they've got a lot going on. Malali's got a lot going on. He's got a lot to worry about, you know. But he invested time with me. Yeah. He made me feel special. How can I do that with whoever I meet? Doesn't matter who they are. And so, well, you cannot be a better friend. I'll tell you that. Thank you, brother. And uh, I'm glad you're investing time with me right now Thank because you. again, there's the ripple effect. I'm the little guy in this case, and you're giving me hey some man, of your time. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the love. You guys, check out John Hennessy's video of his record-breaking run in the Venom GT. It'll blow you away. You're a good man. Thank, thank you very you. much. You too. Uh, keep up all the good work, thank and uh, I'm going to interview your guys at the Tuner School too because I want to learn great. more about that. It's a great story. Hennessyperformance.com. Correct. That's it. Very good. You got it. I'm Alan Taylor. We're here together in Houston for the Grand Prix.